We gon' have fun. We be on fire. We be lit lit. It's a unique hustle. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique house. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Nothing, nothing. You know, my dad will go on. I want y'all to stop what you're doing. Go like, subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms. Share us on all social media platforms. Um, if you want to see our full length interviews, go check out our YouTube membership package because we're going to continue to do this membership and we're going to continue to create content every single day for y'all. You know, y'all love us and we love y'all too. Man, hey man, listen man We got a special treat for you guys today He don't really need an introduction Well, maybe he do, man This guy right here, man We actually seen him uh, He came up on TMZ And a couple of more different locations Where he was voicing um, his place Where he felt he needed to speak uh, On a serious situation mm -hmm. And we're going to get to know him, man This guy's name is George Thomas Welcome to the show Thank you for having me, brother Man, thank you for coming Um Man, um, we gonna definitely uh, go down through there, but I always like to let, I say ladies first, let Miss Jamaica ask you a few questions to just, you know, soften the blow a little bit. Cause when I come with it, <laughs> nigga, it's hardcore, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead, Miss Jamaica. So you born and raised in New Orleans? Yes, ma'am. What part? So originally uptown is where we raised. So I was raised on Martin Luther King. So I still in elementary school, mama and daddy moved across the river on the mm -hmm. West Bank. And that's why everyone know us from the situation we're gonna talk about. Okay, today. how old were you when you when y'all moved to West Bank? Nine, ten, something like oh, that. Oh, so y'all been there for a while. Yeah, uh -huh. Okay, and um you were raised with your mom and dad? Yeah. We're in both the same household? Yeah. Okay. How many kids? Three total. So I had an older brother who mm -hmm. went to corn. Mm-hmm. Like I said, when we lived uptown, but when we moved across the river, he joined the army. He okay. left, and then I had a younger brother, Steve, the one. All boys, there. no girls. All boys. So what was, <laughs> what was it like growing up? So you're the middle child. Correct. So you like okay. that uh, song by uh, 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 what's that light skinned boy, J Cole? <laughs> the middle child. That's the name of it. Did you like that song? Yeah, I like J. Cole. <laughs> That's one of my favorite rappers, man. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. So what was it like being um, raised with an older, younger brother? You know, like I'm the last child, so people always talk about the last kids are spoiled and so forth. No, it's so true. Forth. No, it's not. So <laughs> what is it like being the middle child? So the middle child, I say you, I won't say you ignored, but all of the protection will go to the baby boy because that's the baby mm -hmm. and the older child is is already old so you tend to learn things on your own okay so tell me what was okay so you say mom and dad was there tell me a story about something that um how strict were they were they strict or did they let y'all you know men and women especially men when they have boys as kids they let them do whatever yeah, they let them roam the like streets. That, so. They let them do whatever because y'all boys. They're more protective of girls. But daddy is Native American and Puerto Rican. Okay. Mom is black. Okay. So growing up in that type of household, dad worked for, he was a chef. That was his, his occupation. Mm -hmm. But he worked at this place called Riccobono's in Metairie. So I don't know if you guys actually I've heard know. of Metairie. All right. No, mm -hmm. Rick Abonos is what I'm talking no, about. No, Metairie, okay. it, that's why the they, got, they got that money, don't you? So it was Carlos Marcelo's and okay. all them people. That's who ran the restaurant. Okay. But my dad was the head chef, and mm. they loved him. But because he wasn't, uh, I don't want to say white. Uh, uh, Light not, skin. Right. So he got more love. In New Orleans, we would say passe blanc with the, the okay. light-skinned people, okay. which means pass for white. Right. So the darker skin tend to be back of the house and the lighter skin is front of the house. And your mom was dark skin? Yeah, my mom was dark, real dark. Real dark skin. Yeah. Okay, so daddy worked all the time. Yeah. What did mom worked. do? Mom was a housewife for a long time. Okay. Mom didn't start working until brother passed away. So she raised y'all, so to say. Yeah. Because daddy was always right. working. Mm -hmm. um, and seemed like daddy had a really good job, so y'all had some money. No, daddy had like multiple jobs. Oh, okay. So I won't say we had money, but we did better. So okay. growing up in any hood across America, you won't know it's hood if you got good parents. Mm. So that I will say, but we become a product of our environment. Mm. So kids tend to get in trouble as you get older, mm. but the parents will say you wasn't raised like that, mm -hmm. which is true. Even me, I made straight A's in school. 
I wanted to hang out with a rough crowd because you think that's cool and that's the thing to do. So the streets the called. hip-hop music. Yeah, you become a product of your environment. Okay, that's where I jump in. Um, like, I'm trying to understand. You say you end up getting, I want to make sure we get to the part where you get in trouble. What the heck did you do? So I got locked up for attempted murder. And how old were you? Wow. Yeah, I was 17 at the time. Yo. I was probably 18. Yo. And so how did they, how did they, what happened? Did, did, is this something, did you, you got convicted? Yeah, I uh, got convicted of what, it. I was got it a, a night at a nightclub? Was you no, on so the my situation, uh, my, told you my big brother was in the Army. Mm -hmm. So I tried to join the military as well. So you take, I forget what it's called, but you take, take the, the test, yeah. right? And I go to boot camp. I finish boot camp. Upon coming back, I get into a situation with a gentleman. Okay. Gentleman pull a knife on me. I take the knife. I use the knife on him, and then I shoot him. And they said it wasn't self-defense because I did too much stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so you took it too far. Right. Right. Wow. And, and he had a punctured lung, cracked rib. Dude was in a hospital for like maybe two and a half weeks, which is ironic. We'll talk about was it. Was it an argument? Was it a, what started all of this? Yeah, he was um he was trying to attack someone that I knew. Oh, somebody I that was there with you? Yeah. And you Not, jumped in. Right. He had hurt them previously. Oh. Yeah. It was a girl okay. that he had hit. So I took it upon myself to fix the situation. Oh, okay. Wow. So and and so you end up you 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 end up stabbing the guy. Yeah, I took his, his knife, knife. I stabbed him, and then I shot then you him shot with, my gun. with your right. gun. And they and said it was too much, too much stuff to say it was self defense. Correct. Yeah. Did he live or did he pass? Away? No, he lived. He okay. ended up like I said. He was two and a half weeks in a hospital. Um, came testified against me, which is dumb. Oh, he yeah. came. Yeah, he came to court, pointed me out, and everything. But because I was in the military, I had a They said you sentence, were trained. Right. And you were wow. trained. So I got a 16-year sentence that got cut to 12, but I had to do eight on that 12. Wow. Wow. So when you look at that, uh, how long? That was a process. It didn't just happen like you just explained it. That probably happened over a period of a year, year and a half. Right. You out here trying to figure it out. How tough was that just trying to understand how to maneuver or where your life was headed during the time you was trying to figure out the sentencing? So when you're trying to figure out the sentencing, you in, in space because you don't know what's going to happen. And like I'm I won't I'm not afraid to say like I was scared because I had never been locked up for a long period of time. Yeah. So I'm thinking like you never coming home and you hearing these numbers that they talking 25, 20, 12, 10. And you gotta, to you somebody that's it. about to be 18 is like, that's forever. Yeah, yeah. And you basically at that point, you trying your best to understand where you, how can you bounce back from this even before you take it? Right, right. right. Like, how am I going to be able to make it through this? You know, so you were seventeen. So you were tried as a juvenile or an, as an no, adult? Adult. I, I turned eighteen in there. Waiting. In the while right, you were doing, yeah. okay. And they knew that. That's one of the plays they do. Yeah, they to want pull to, it out. Yeah, they want to make sure out. to stretch it right. till they can try you as an adult. Or yeah, it happened here. But he's eighteen. He knows better. And blah blah blah. Um, for so, go ahead. so, how did this um, affect? Because you see. Your brother was already in the military. Did that affect him? The older brother? Yes. Not really. Like he, so I don't know if any of you guys ever been. No. So my brother was, was frontline infantry. Mm -hmm. So he already came back with what I call PTSD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And brother, if you're watching this, I swear I mean no disrespect by this, but he already came back trying to get himself acclimated yeah. to society. How much older is he than you? 14 years. Wow. Because oh. he's my dad's son. He's not my mom's son. Oh, okay. so he's way older. Yeah. Okay. So okay. dad, 10 years older than mom. Mm -hmm. So my brother is 14, 14 years, years yeah. older. And you and your younger brother is how, how close in age? So we're three years apart. Three years yeah. apart. Okay, okay. Okay. So you end up, after you end up getting this sentence, they, they definitely play with you trying to figure out to get you to take this, to get you to take that. Right. That's what they do. And you decided I'm, you're going to take the, the, you got eight, but you got more than that. How, yeah, you, I got 16. 16. I was stupid. First. If I could go back now in hindsight, they were offering me eight, and I would have had to do four, and I would have took it. Yeah. But like I said, you telling any kid about time, they don't want to hear that because mm -hmm. it seems like the door is going to close forever. Wow. Did you ever have any other experiences because of that? 
relatives, people that was locked up, anybody that came at you about that situation? No, so I had, while I was getting locked up, I had other cousins because New Orleans culture is like Correct, that. That that's right, that's why I asked. Getting charges. So my cousin Purvis, who's in Angola right now, same thing, double murder he was convicted of. How much um, time he got? Mandatory life sentence in Louisiana. Mm. And then a couple other cousins with the drug charges and all the stuff that come with the territory. Wow. So. And you said, sorry, but you said pre, you said um, this is the first time you had to spend that much time in 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 prison. Mm -hmm. So you've actually no, got in been. trouble before. And I just have went, been in trouble yeah. before. Really? Yeah. yeah, you had gotten in a trouble before. Charge before. Okay, a, uh, but you didn't spend that much grounds. time. Right, I ended up getting probation for that. You had okay. a, a crack charge. Yeah. So they so caught distribution you in house. crack. How much did they catch you? Not. At that time, it was like a quarter ounce, and you know the fourteen-year-old mm -hmm. kid. You thinking that's that's money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But so you were fourteen get, when you caught that. Right. Kid. And I got kicked out of school. So when I got kicked out of school, I had two years probation for that. So when that was finished, I still couldn't go back to Jefferson Orleans because I had a drug charge. On that's me. why you decided to go to the military. Right. So I got a GED first, got and it. then I pursued the whole military thing was my vision. Got it. Wow, that's pretty smart as a kid to think like that, to try to figure out a way to maneuver in, in that type of it environment. It was the probation officer, though, so I can't He was help Oh, yeah. he suggested. It was like, uh, you're still young. This is what you can do. You can, And that was like the outlet. Man. But although it was his... Um, suggestion most kids would be like man I'm going back to the streets I'm going to do what I know yeah but the streets like home with my mama is like not an option so <laughs> <laughs> mama going to get on till this day she still get on you so mama is always mama is why I say any kid that get in trouble people can't say it's because of lack of parenting mm -hmm. because I know even my dad he did the gambling he did all the stuff he did but deep down, I know it was still discipline there. So you was going to respect mama when you came in the house, certain things you wasn't going to do. Right. You was going to act like you were raised correctly. Like mm -hmm. like the movie Fences by Denzel Washington. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they, you know, nigga don't know what's going on, but you gonna respect mama, you gonna right. respect this house, and don't ask me for nothing unless I want to give it to you. And they still, so they went, no matter what they did, two things she always told me, and this I even do with my kids till mm -hmm. this day, pray before bed, which they always did, and they would go to church, and they still go to church, uh... <laughs> Uh, uh, Israelite Baptist Church yeah, 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 across yeah. the street from where Dito used to be. Okay, okay. So that's why when people tell me and talk to me, I'm like, what the hell are you talking? Like, I grew up uptown, but I came into myself as an adolescent across the river. But mom and them still go to that church even when we moved on to West Bank. Wow. And tell this day, they still go to Israelite wow. Baptist Church. Wow. Yeah. And, it's been, and they've been going there the whole time. Yeah. All and they still time. live in West Bank? And they still live, they live in West, West Bank. Bank. Wow. Shout out to Mobo Joe. He came on here. <laughs> Mobo Joe, you I heard I watched him? it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Mobo. Uh, I, I just, the one thing I can say, man, is, is, is coming up in New Orleans and doing all these interviews, I've been intrigued by the whole scenario. And we, we, we you know, in case the people don't know who you are, you are the brother of the, the, guy, the young man that was killed at 16. Steve Thomas. Steve Thomas. Uh, basically... The one that C murder is locked up right now for Correct. his uh, for for his murder, mm -hmm. um, and the one thing that I seen when I seen you online was you were contesting that that this is something that's relevant that it's true, right? And I want to tell this to the audience: this is like no way a, a C murder bashing session because I forgave that brother, and had I not, I wouldn't be able to freely speak the way I'm speaking now. Yeah. So what made me speak out about the situation is for 20 years, you get tired of hearing someone was railroaded and he's innocent. And my mom and dad never had the proper time to grieve. I couldn't even grieve from in prison. And right, then, wait a minute. You, you were in prison when this happened. Correct. And I'm going to walk up to that day because I don't want to, I don't want to pat bypass that. All right. You were, you were locked up in prison. Mm-hmm. 2002. Uh, 2000. How long had you been locked up? Because I know why you went, because we just talked yeah, yeah. about that. But how and long? I, I had only been locked up a year. You had only been gone a year. Mm -hmm. And did you feel like when, what, 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 when that happened, where were your mind at? Like when you first heard it, you what were you doing? Um, I was asleep, so I got it. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. 
the chaplain comes to yourself. Anyone right. passing your family, the chaplain comes. So it's about three in the morning and I'm asleep. And the chaplain's he's banging on it. I was in Leavenworth. Okay. He's banging on the cell and then the cell door slide open. So I don't know what's going on. But when I see him I just know it's a okay. somebody passed. So he brings me outside and he tell me my older brother called and said that Steve had been killed and that I need to call home. Wow. So did they let you immediately call home at yeah, that time? They let me immediately so call home. So when you call home, you, you you I know you right now you you're confused, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's tough you trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. And and you how close were you and your brother? We were I won't say we were, were close as best friends, but we were siblings. Yeah. So he would ask me certain stuff or he would look to me for advice, whether it was about girls, clothes, or whatever the case. Okay, and so you call home. Who do you get on the phone? So when I call home, my cousin answers the phone. And she's crying. She's crying her heart out. And I'm like, what happened? What's going on? And she's like, he's gone. He's dead. And I'm like, what happened? What happened? And she said, oh, they say it was C-murder. Oh, she it's the first that. thing that she tells me before he was even picked up. This is when he pronounced that. So this is the night of the shooting. And did you personally know C murder at that time? No, I like we were fans of No Limit. So much fans. Uh, this guy Brockton. So me and my cousin Glenn, we went to L.W. Higgins High School. This is where I got put out for the drugs. Mm -hmm. And we went to school with Carlos from Beats by the Pound. Yeah, I yeah. think this guy is either Carlos' little uh, brother's friend or cousin or something. I'm not sure how they knew the connection. Mm -hmm. But the guy was, Brockton was heavily connected with them. And you could call Carlos. I don't know if he remember this, but you can ask him. So Brockton uh, calls me and Glenn because everybody wanted to be a part of No Limit. Yeah. Cash Money was running the city because they were the, the hands-on people and like the local celebrities. But No Limit had took things to a national, national stage. Level. That's right. That's so right. everybody wanted, oh, No Limit Soldiers was bumping, the TRU this. Like, everybody loved them and wanted to be like them, including us. So Carlos says, uh, not, not Carlos, Brockton says he knows Carlos, and he could bring us to Carlos. So me and my cousin Glenn, we like 14 at the time. Wow. And we, Go ahead. I just want to know, like, once you heard that, and once you heard that he was gone, I know it had to be tough trying to do time, you know, and not being able to properly grieve. Because right. you didn't get no, you didn't get to come home for no furlough or nothing like that. You didn't get to go to his funeral. How did you find closure in that time? Oh, um, God, man, that was it. That's how I had to find closure with myself because you, you go crazy. Whether anyone dies or not, the first two years of prison is the hardest for anybody. And anybody that been down there can tell you. Because you, part of your mind keeps saying, oh, my appeal is going to work. No, no matter that everybody else's appeals took five and six years, correct. you thinking your You're appeals going to gonna be, years. yeah, that's correct. my appeal's coming. I don't know what I need to do. Is this real? Try to go to that law library. Right. You're trying to see how I can get out. The reality hadn't set it's in. Set in, yeah. So, so you waste about hardest. a year or nine months trying to figure that out. And the last two is the hardest because you can see the end of the road, but it's not coming fast enough. So, um, when you heard this news and they, they mentioned his name, um, did they say why they said it was him who told them that it was him? No. So, initially, they just said it was C-Murder. It mm -hmm. was no uh, backstory about what happened or anything. So, I'm assuming they were doing an investigation. Okay. And then I'm in Leavenworth and I'm watching MTV News used to come on. And this was probably like a week later, they tell says he was picked up from House of Blues. So this is how I realized he was picked up. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, because of the way it was transpiring, a lot of people was coming forward. A lot of people were saying it wasn't C murder. Mm -hmm. I know you, the streets talk, but the, in prison, you get information as well. Right. You hearing double sided stories on if it really was C murder, why are you locked up? Yeah, I was hearing both sides Correct. of it. You're hearing two things. That, he did it and that he didn't do it. Yeah. So this is what I, up until my release date, I heard this. People would come in, oh, I was there, or so-and-so was there. Uh, this one told me this, this one told me that. How confusing was that for you? It was very confusing because as God is my witness, at that point, I never, 
I myself never said I was 100% sure he was guilty because I kept hearing all these different stories and I wasn't on the streets. And you didn't know who to believe because you weren't there. Correct. And At that, that time, I didn't. Correct. Right. And, and the thing is, um, we know that in this case, there were, you, you. I know you got your paperwork, mm -hmm. but in this case, there has been a lot of people to come forward as witnesses for C-murder. Mm -hmm. There's people that then came forward and say they actually did this murder themselves. Um, there's been so many different things that were thrown, scenarios that was thrown. Um, but today, and the way that you see things, you say that this pretty much, you without a doubt think that C-murder did it. Correct, I will go to my right? grave thinking he done it now. And I'll tell you why. Yeah, we gonna get to it. Right. But I'm just, uh, that's the part what, and, and, and when I came, when I first, when me, me and you talked and the girl told me about you and you called me or whatever, that was the thing that tugged at me the most. This guy, George, of course he's emotional, it's his brother. Mm -hmm. But not only is he emotional, because it's his brother, I would be. You All understand right. what I'm saying? But you being locked up, it's hard to, in my mind, I'm just telling you how I was mm -hmm. thinking, like how do he know for sure? How could he be sure that this, that, that, that that C murder had murdered your brother. And I was like, man, I don't know if I'm gonna even bring him on the show. I'm being real because I'm like, I don't wanna be in no gray area and I know where he coming from because that's his brother. If something happened to my brother, either one of them, I only got two, I'd be like messed up. Even if I and fairly being locked up in here or something like that. So that was the tug of war for me. Like how could this guy be so sure that C murder was the one that done this if he wasn't there. When you got all these different stories transitioning, but then people coming forward, but then the court system saying, no, he did it. We Or people him recanting up. Or people recanting, statements. you know, it's just a lot of back and mm -hmm. forth. And it's been that way now for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I can only imagine how your parents feel, to be honest with you, because a 16 year old kid, first of all, my biggest question was why was he at the club? How could he even get in a club at he that He had age? a fake ID. I can tell you that. So okay. all those rumors, that was true. It wasn't rumors. So one of my friends, because he had guilt on his heart, and I won't say his name out That's of fine. respect for him, but one of my friends, when I came home, came to me and said, hey, I gave him the ID. And he was crying and, like, real hurt. And of course. I was like, hey, I'm not mad at you. You're not God. So you wouldn't have known what would have happened. You know, yeah. if he wouldn't have got that. I went to clubs as, you. as a younger man. I know you. I don't know if right. you done it, but I know when I was young. Oh, I was. I started going to clubs when was I was an eleven-year-old club. Too. I don't care. Right. I, mine was a twenty-one. Right. I was going at twelve. I knew somebody. Right. So I was in the club at eleven and twelve years old. She's heard these stories over mm -hmm. and over. Right. I've been going to the club, dancing with grown women since I was eleven. <laughs> I'm being real, and I don't know how I look. I had to look pretty weird because I'm already <laughs> short, and these girls were rocking with me too. So they had to be pretty drunk. But my thing is, this was a this was a teenage club. Correct. So when everyone always asks me, I'm like, listen, it was a teenage club. It wasn't a club where it's, it's 30 and up or 25 yeah. and up. Yeah. I'm like, no, 16, 17, 18 year olds were known for going in this club. Wow. Okay, but the thing that I, I, I want, okay, you were you went to jail mm -hmm. or prison the year before. I mm -hmm. want to know. What was your brother like um, before you left to go to jail? Meaning, like, was he in the streets? Was he, well, I know you said your you mom jumped, had. You jumped out early. You did. But was your brother like that? that yeah, was she right. To because I know that your mom, she had her foot on, on y'all's neck trying to keep y'all in trouble and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But still, mama don't know everything. Because I'm a, I'm a parent and, you know, mm. you have kids. One might tell you everything, but the other one might not. You know what lying. I mean? They both lie. <laughs> and they, but they will know each other's business when right. mama might not. You know what I mean? And um, the reason why I'm asking that, because I know people watching probably thinking that same thing, wondering, okay, was there an altercation? Did he start it? Did he start it? What happened? Whoever it was right. that did this. You know what I mean? What exactly escalated? Just like how you said your story, mm -hmm. when um, the reason why you got into it with the guy that um, you stabbed, it was because of a girl that he did such and such to, mm -hmm. why that happened. But you can say that for sure because you were there because that was your incident. Right. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, leading up to what was his character like? Who was he? 
and so forth. My brother was no, no street kid. So unlike me, he watched me get in trouble. It's why I, it was hurting to me as well when it happened. Yeah, because you feel like he was Because that's what I assumed at first, like he was telling me. But my brother was more of what we call in New Orleans a pretty boy. Mm -hmm. The S curls, the, the girls was his thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, and I know you wasn't there that night, but mm -hmm. allegedly, like what called, what, what caused the, the, the issue? Right. So what, what I heard Fiend say, and again, I, I wasn't there, so I don't know. And Fiend was there that night? I don't know if Fiend heard this from somebody or what, but according to him and other people, I must just say Fiend because he's the most known. But what I heard him say and the others say was that it was a rap battle. This is the, the majority story that I get from the beginning, that it was a rap battle that No Limit was, uh, I'm sorry, TRU was promoting whomever they knew all this was. And you've been in the industry long enough, so I must say we have a rap battle tonight, but uh, my man is my artist, so I'm going to make sure he wins. That's what this is about, but I'm not going to say that to the public. I'm going to just say we have a rap battle. So supposedly whomever they had, they were promoting my brother. I rapped this guy. Oh, your brother rapped? Yeah, and I didn't know that either, but he outrapped them. And when my brother I rapped him, when I guess when he was getting off the stage, someone bumped him, and they they had words amongst each other. And then when he tried to push him, my brother grabbed his shirt or chain or something, and then ten other guys rushed him. This is the continuous story that I hear from everyone. So if they can't agree on nothing, everyone else agrees with this story. So the rap battle was the this was the thing that started the issue with that night of how things fell right. out. But like a, uh, going back to the other story, it, it was funny to me because I remember me and my cousin Glenn uh, with the guy uh, Brock bringing us to Carlos to rap for Carlos to want to be under no limit at 14. Mm -hmm. So we were legit fans. So this is why the stuff comes out of, of like my brother was a diehard fan because we were. But the thing is, again, with you not being there, mm -hmm. again, with you hearing stories, the one thing that I do know is people who knew you, people who respect you, and people who just pretty much felt condolence. Mm -hmm. When they talk to you, they're definitely gonna, they're gonna have compassion on that situation. So it's like the story that they're telling you, believe me, it's gonna be seasoned correctly because if you come to me about my brother, right. You better have it together, especially when I wasn't here. Right. And I've been gone in eight years in the Fed, federal penitentiary, and I didn't stab somebody, and I didn't, you know what I'm saying, I'm being mm -hmm. real, I'm a street dude. So when they come to you, of course old boy crying, of course it, cause they got to come correct. I'm just being real. If I'm a person that's coming to you. But I'm a nerd boss talk, I ain't a street I don't <laughs> care what you say, you say whatever, you can say I'm a nerd all day, but paperwork don't say you a damn nerd. <laughs> Am I right? So you, you uh, and then a person who coming to you, he know. Cause if you're a cat that's in the streets and you've been in these streets a long time, you know how to move. You know you ain't for to come wrong. Right. I don't know who these dudes is that's coming to you. Right. But if a nigga come to me about something on that level, and I done been through what I done been through, he got to come correct. I don't care what nobody say. So I get it. I, I understand why you passionately feel like these people were telling you the, you truth, know, the right? truth. Because of the who, of who you are. Who, who you, who you, the person you are is going to predict of how these people are going to come to you. Is what, I'm, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing, though, one thing I always say, you know, people coming to me and telling me stories or telling me things, I always say, hearsay don't stand up in court. Meaning like, People telling me all these things. Are you, were you there that night? Are you willing to go in front of the court and say that you were there that That's night? Cool. Yeah. And this is what mm -hmm. you saw. And this is, if you're not willing to say that, then we can't, we can't even talk about this because it don't make no sense. Right. You, you understand what I mm -hmm. mean? And then also take in consideration, how drunk were you that night? How much did you see that night? Where were you standing that night? There's a lot of things, just like when we were in court, you know, these are all the questions that, right, they, right. that they ask. Agreed. You know what I mean? And not only that, if time has passed, how sure are you at all the things you, 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 you say you remember? How many people 
I know this is a popular person, mm -hmm. but how many people were wearing the same thing he was wearing, something close to it? How many people, you know, there's just so many but different things. How crowded? Things. It was how crowded, crowded in They there. said it was crowded. When right. Mobile Joe came um, on here, he said he was there that night, but it was so crowded, he didn't see anything. He said it was so crowded, um, you couldn't really tell unless the only people that could tell you anything if they were standing like right, right there. in that vicinity. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And then another thing that I've always, there's this, um, game that we used to play in Jamaica, we used to call Chinese telephone. Meaning like, if I tell you one thing and you pass it on to somebody and someone is the person at the end of the line. Got a totally different story. Got a totally right. different story. So it's a lot of different things you take in consideration. With a lot of people coming to you and telling you different things, it's, okay, is it somebody who told you that? Were you? That's the first thing, because I'm very, the older I got, I'm very straightforward. I'm straight to the point. Like, were you there that night? That's the first thing I'm going to ask anybody who come to me and say anything. Were you standing close by that? You Are you sure that you saw X, Y, Z? Correct. I don't need anything that somebody told you, and you're telling me that somebody told so, you. So, yeah. So, you see, what she's saying, how many, what eyewitness did you talk to that you feel was there, right there when it happened? Two of them. Was these the guys that recanted their statement? One of them was the one that recanted their statement, and the other one was C. Murder's right-hand man, a bodyguard, uh, Wango. And he told you that? Face to face after he took the plea trial agreement with the courts. And he did this before the second trial. So he was going to be charged himself. He got picked up for a drug case and whatever else he was doing because he was a known killer in New Orleans on the street. Like, let's be honest. But he was the one who was supposed to solidify uh, C. Murder's street credit or whatever from the rap game. But Wango was a, a heavy street name. So when this happened, he said C. Murder was the only one to get in the club with the gun because he was the superstar. Everyone else got patted down and couldn't get, get in a club without getting patted down. But, <clears throat> and, and I have to say but, mm -hmm. even if I was the one that's coming in, and I don't know, I wasn't there. I, I'm, this is all speculation and alleged for me. Okay. Um, if I'm the superstar, the way I moved, it, it, I wouldn't be the one with the pistol, for sure. I'm just being real right. with you. I, I might get it in you. for you. <clears throat> Let's be real. But you got I'm too not many the, people. I got too many people with right. me. I'm not for the be, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm worth something. I wasn't there, but I'm just saying I'm worth right. something. So even if I was to do this, nigga, you got to do this or whatever, because I'm, I'm focused. But according to him, he was high. So what a lot of people may not know, New Orleans know, is that you know, heroin is their drug of choice. Right. So he was like, he was getting down and he was loaded. And so is this C? Lying. Not, 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 not C. No, this C. This is what oh, Wango C. tells oh, me okay, about okay, C. Okay. That C was out his mind and this is what happened that night. Wow. And he tells the same story that the other witness who changed the story, and we'll get to him too. Um, but he told the exact same story. And I know those two don't run in the same crowds together because Peanut was a, he was a football star. Okay. And, uh, they wouldn't have ran in there, but he was security that night. But Peanut recanted his statement. Right. So if Peanut recanted his statement, why would he, he don't have to? Why would he recant it? Because he was getting blackballed in the industry. For his music? Yeah. But you ever heard of I him? Never, I don't know the nigga, but I'm just <laughs> My saying. My point exactly. Is he out right now? <laughs> yeah, suppose Shy Nut, you could Google him. No, but he, that's the that's the rap name. But is he still rapping right now? I guess I don't know. He so, was trying to do something. Last I heard, he was trying to do promotion in Miami or so. Oh, so. But he, when I came home from jail, he was another one. Prior to the the recanning, prior to the second trial, mm -hmm. word for word, what he said on the stand the first time is what he told me and my family. He would come to our house. He used to cut my hair because he was a barber as well. So he knew y'all before? He knew your brother and everybody? No, he had to know my brother. I met him when I came home, I met him. He ran with my cousin BJ, so all of them were like the same age. So, yeah, he, your brother age. Yeah, so when, he, when I came home, BJ told me first that, hey, this is what Peanut said. Like I said, prior to any trial, so when I talked to him and he said the same thing, but he was scared. That's why I said he called the police on three different times. All this is black and white. But what he said was he felt threatened because Wango came to the club, took the tape, destroyed the tape, and then threatened all of them. 
and said they better not testify. So when Wango said the same story that he said years later, you can't tell me that. that but was Wango didn't testify. No, Wango documents were sealed because his telling was on a bigger stage. He didn't only tell about the C-murder stuff and the destroying the tape. He told the feds that Master P uh, paid him to make the stuff go away. Okay, well, where is Wango now? Wango's dead. He got killed in 2018. How did Wango get killed? I don't know the story, but supposedly they the streets will say that it's related to this stuff. Some would say he was beat. They got like all kind of Superman stories is what I call them. But from what I gather from the DA and the lead sergeant, because we were all told when it was happening as well, that he got shot in the back of the head and then decapitated. So whoever shot him had to know him because you're not gonna drive around with someone that you don't know. And at that distance, so it had to be someone that he knows that, that shot him in the back of the head. Wow, this is this is a, this is stuff that 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 like I said, you you almost don't want to be centered in conspiracy theory, right? But People it's here. The documents were sealed until no, no, he got no, no, no. murdered. Oh, 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 once the once he got murdered, they 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 unsealed the documents. Yeah, but and that's when you started say, believing. That's because before that, because you were hearing all these different stories, mm -hmm. you didn't believe anything. But once it became unsealed, that's when you started no, believing. No, I believed it. Because even when it was sealed, the family knew because the DA always got to tell the family. Okay. So I believed it when I came home and Wango said the exact same story that Peanut said. Mm -hmm. And then the first trial, and I want to clear this up too because it's a huge misconception that it was a hung jury in the first trial. It was not. The first trial was a 12-0 conviction guilty but it was overseen by the lady uh, Martha Sassoon mm -hmm. who granted him a retrial because she said uh, the witnesses, I guess something the DA was trying to hold back. So when Wango told his story about C. Murdo with the gun and them throwing the gun away, he also said that Master P allegedly gave money to this judge. Now here's where the conspiracy come in because I was like, I don't know how much this is true yeah. and how much of this is street talk, but it was enough to get the feds involved to look at P is why P didn't come to the second trial. But it was so the same judge that was on the first trial is the same judge on the second trial. Negative, no, a she different. stepped down. Yeah, she stepped down and she resigned, <clears throat> and then they had a new judge. Well, let me let me ask you this: uh, Peanut and Kenneth Jordan mm -hmm. both came forward and said that C Murder was innocent, right? Right. But you saying Peanut? Did you know Kenneth Jordan? Yeah, I know Peanut personally. Okay. But did you, did you? I don't know. Uh, Dar I'm sorry. Darnell, Darnell Jordan. Jordan. Peanut, yeah. Kenny Jordan, I don't know. You don't know Kim? No. You never talked to him? I never talked to him. But but he was there that night, too. Right. So them two, except for Peanut, mm -hmm. recanted his statement, said one thing, and then came. Did he come forward and said he was innocent first? No. So Peanut, I guess whatever the show is, the, uh, what is it, Reasonable Doubt show or whatever, um, when I watched the show, because they was like, oh, see, murder going to be on there tonight. So I was like everybody. I'm tuned in. Like I said, I'm still a fan of the music. So when I'm watching a show, because Peanut had been cutting my hair and we had formed a, a relationship at that time, I called his cell phone. And I'm like, bro, what the? Like everybody else. And He said he, he was in his on there. On the show. On yeah. the show. And that's but that's not it. what he told you before. Yeah, or after. I'm about to get to it. So I call him on the phone, and as God is my witness, this man tells me, bro, that's Hollywood is the difference between uh, real life and the entertainment world. And I was like, it don't matter. So your entertainment world interfering with my family's peace. So talk to me like man to man. And what did he say? And what he tells me is it's not going nowhere. He was trying to, whatever the single was, I think, at the time, Marrero or something, but, that he was getting blackballed in the industry. And this is out his mouth, that he was getting blackballed in the music industry. And then he went on a, a his IG page, I think, since it's been cut. But then he went on a free C murder rant because everybody was calling him a snitch. And I was like, I understood after being pissed off for the night i was like i i understand like he want to get on but that's what he wanted to do. but if that's the case um 
you would think that right now he should be up in his music Correct. if that's the case. Right, but everybody right. should know who mm -hmm. he is. But nobody it's knows. Like who, it's not right. like that. Right. So that that kind of that throws an arrow into that. You, so he his word going back and forth like that mm -hmm. is no matter what is really not trustworthy in, in what he the only one that cannot do right and keep in mind now he testified at both trials so you can say you got tricked the first time let's assume you don't know any better like the most of the world here when it comes to this stuff and you were tricked the first time mm -hmm. you're not going to tell me that you got tricked in the saying and doing the same thing the second trial so for him it was just entertainment and trying to get the snitch name off his back me as a grown ass man i don't care what you call me and i got kids now that's who i'm here to live for so other than you bringing trouble to my front door i don't care what the rest of the world think you so know? on the second trial did they re did they recall all the witnesses and everybody um physically to the second trial to testify again yeah and they bought wango documents in but wango didn't physically want to testify because whatever the feds had in their trial which I found out later was the stuff he said about Master P and a record company being funded by Richard Pina and all of that stuff. But so why wouldn't he come personally and say it? I don't know. Like the documents were sealed, remember, for the mm -hmm. second trial. Right. But I guess he was, anytime something happens in the feds and the document seal is usually a high profile case or a high name case. Mm -hmm. And people say, okay, I don't want to be known as a snitch, but everybody who's been in the feds, Know that the feds only seal those documents right, if you play ball. Right. Right. I always I was reading something and it was saying that um, on the second trial, some of the witnesses they had a recording that they weren't there personally. They mm -hmm. had a recording of their voices from the first trial that they weren't actually there on the second trial. One of the girls, so the girls, and I think I talked about that. She had urinated on herself. She was scared. So she told the detectives that C Murder did it, but when it came to trial, she said, no, it wasn't him. And that uh, people were trying to make her testify. But she urinated on herself. And when she saw my dad in the hallway, she told my dad she was sorry and she was crying. And my dad understood. He was like, I, like, because all of them was getting threatened. Were you the there that had day? To get ro uh, relocated. Oh, the second trial, right? No, this, that's the first. No, yeah, that's the stuff I hear from the first trial. No, I'm, yeah, I'm talking about the second trial, oh. that they weren't there the second no, trial. No, no, they weren't there. The second trial, I was there the whole time. Yeah, that the witnesses weren't there. Weren't there. The only, the only person the was there audio. was his family and Mia X was there. And, right. And his immediate family. But I'm like, there. why weren't the witnesses there the second time? I don't know. The girl didn't show up. Peanut. And Kenny Jordan was there, though, the mm -hmm. second trial. Kenny said he was innocent again. No, on the second trial, Kenny said he was guilty. They both said he was guilty. On the second trial? Correct. They didn't change their statement until 2016, 2017. Like I said, when he was trying to break into the music industry. So the thing is, if to come back like that and to keep... These changing the stories, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, but you know what happened with him? Like I said, I don't know him personally, but I'm going by black and white. So every time something happens, the DA calls us. The, the family witness protection people call us every time something happens. So Kenny Jordan child passed away. I don't know what the circumstances of it, but the child died. When the child died, he called the DA because he wasn't going to testify at the first trial. So when his child, his child died, he said he know how that feels to lose a kid, and he wanted to do the right thing by testifying. This is why he came to the second trial. The, they, Ron Flowers came forward mm -hmm. and said that he committed this murder, right? Uh, correct. Ron Flowers... Then did he recant it or did he, what happened with that? So three weeks before the second trial, Juan Flowers said he committed Juan the murder. Flower, Juan, <clears throat> Juan, Juan, Juan. He said he w -I -N? committed J-U-A-N. Juan, mm -hmm. Juan, okay. You got that Louisiana accent. <laughs> so he said he killed my brother. So the lead DA said Juan Flowers was already serving a life sentence in Georgia. So when he said he did it, the DA said, okay, you already serving a life sentence. You killed a 16-year-old child. 
we want the debt penalty. So we accept your guilty plea, but we want the debt penalty. And then not even an hour later, his lawyer called the DA and said he made that story up. And they were like, what about you will be charged with perjury? Say, I already got life. I would take a perjury charge, but I'm not doing the death penalty. And did he say why he came up, made up, so to say? He said he was paid to say that he took the charge because he was trying to derail the trial. The same thing he said on the show, except they may have cut out the paid part, but they left the... Uh, he was he was trying to mess up the trial or derail the trial. So they did say that part. Did you at any point, because of all the back and forth, did you ever feel like C. Murder was innocent? No. When I first heard it, I didn't know. I didn't know if he was innocent or guilty because me being in jail around the people I was around, I try to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And me having a, a, a older brother and cousins that was... In the game, I was taught well, so I'm not gonna bring nothing to you unless I have solid, concrete evidence. So I never made up my mind if he was guilty or innocent. I even told my parents, I was like, well, we really don't know. So even after the first trial when he was found guilty because I was still in jail, I said, hey, I don't know. When I came home and did my own research, and now I got your own friend, Wango, saying the same story that Peanut said, and those two don't run together, I was like, no, this had, this is the truth. And then when Wine Flowers come with his stuff, I was like, no, he is guilty. But Juan Flowers, again, <laughs> what he said he was paid or whether he, there would be some kind of, there's no evidence that he got paid or anything. <clears throat> no, I don't think they, he's serving a life sentence, so nobody looked into it. The feds try to look into the, the other stuff, but I don't think that went nowhere. You see anywhere. what I'm saying? Because like that would have been a paper trail. Yeah. Or that would have been something. If there's no evidence showing that he was paid, it's hard to, because that would pretty much seal the deal. Something was right. wrong. <laughs> Nobody has really ever uh, caught, and, and I know you're going to say, well, just it moved different in the streets, but there's been no evidence of anybody from the Miller family paying anybody that they could put their finger on, right? Right. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There nobody has said, yeah, so, these people that's talking, saying this and saying that, have never came forward with evidence saying, here, this is the proof that he paid me this. Right, but it's you hard to I'm refute saying? if these are your friends. Like, but you see where I'm coming I from? I got you. Like, I like some, you would think, because so many people in the rap game get mad at everybody. We right. know that. After 20 years, because that's how long it's been now, mm -hmm. right? In 20 years, I just, man, I, for me, being a, a dude that kind of stay, people are flaky, bro. You understand what I'm saying? Something yeah. should have been popped up to me. That's just my thinking. If something should be done popped up, whether it be some kind of way to, to really say, hey, this is, I know for a fact, this here is it. You know what I'm saying? Now I know, but the black and white, I want to get in that paperwork because I want you to tell me why the paperwork gives you this much confidence. That. It's, the, it's just the same stuff I just that you told just said, you. Okay, in paperwork. Yeah, it's just I the got, same I stuff in paperwork. But I got a phone. question. I got it. I, I got you now. Because I got a question. Because mm -hmm. um, we've interviewed a lot of people from New Orleans, not really about this case or anything mm -hmm. like that. But I hear a lot of people from New Orleans say that um, Louisiana um, justice system is so corrupt. Um, in so many different cases, how many times people get wrongly convicted or they, the, the prison system is terrible or just um, people, they railroad you, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I've even heard of cases where somebody, because you're in a public figure, they will, rail, not say railroad you, but they'll use you over anybody else just to make an example, whether for their own political endeavors or not. Um, do you feel like that could be a possibility? Well, anything's possible. I'm not naive and I'm not going to come on here and say, like I said, I wasn't there that night. Right. But you can't tell me these are your best friends. These are guys that you cut for, that you say these are your brothers. So if these guys saying you were the trigger man, regardless of anything else, like that does it for me. Okay. okay. I want to I want to move forward a little bit. Because of all of the campaign you've had, in, in, you had to really endure, like all of the free C murder campaign, mm -hmm. from whether it be from uh, the Miller family, whether it be from Kim Kardashian, 
Monica, these are high profile people. Right. And I see on uh, that TMZ segment that Kim Kardashian and you went back and forth. Just kind of break that down to me and explain to me how that even happened. Because I don't, like, to all of them, I don't think they read the case. They going by, I'm assuming, what he told him. Because if you read this stuff, you're not going to, like I said, you can diffuse that if nothing was with a paper trail, that they wasn't paid, the money, whatever. But you can't say that these guys, his brothers are lying. Like, these are his people, his own people, that said he was the trigger man. So explain to me how you and... What did you think when you seen Kim? Kim, she she came. She's been working hard, desperately trying to get free, uh, free C murder. Get, I get felt like it was a slap in the face to the family. I felt like she jumped on this case. That's where I was going. That it's a high profile case, so you jumped on a case without reading all of the facts. And you, I know you didn't research these witnesses, or you wouldn't have jumped on the fact that that's the reason. Uh, they changed their story because had you done the research, you would say, hey, I'm not getting in this case. And then my family can't properly mourn because every year, whether it's BT, whether it's something on YouTube, whether it's something else coming forward, it's like it's always uh, he's innocent. He was railroaded. And for us, we was quiet this whole time. So even when I came home, my mom said, don't talk, don't say nothing. And I stayed quiet, and I was like, you know what, it'll go away. So when the appeals was finished, I said, hey, it'll go away. So then I'm watching No Limit Chronicles. It don't go away. Then I hear uh, the industry talk, and it don't go away. And then I hear her talking about this case again. And I'm like, man. And then reading the comments, oh, and this pisses me off to the 10th degree, to people that say it was about money. My family never got a dime of that money. Ever bankruptcy was filed, so it was never about money. It was about grieving and finding bank, peace. Bankruptcy was filed on what? TRU Records, or whoever the hell they. Oh, filed you were saying the cause of? Yeah, uh, yeah. So they never got a dime of that money. I've been taking care of my family, and I say that proudly and happily. So, like, we were good. It was never about that. It's about peace and closure, but wow. we never able to get the peace and closure. So that's the reason I started my YouTube videos. And I said I forgive that brother because that's the only way that I was I'll be able to talk and do this because before I couldn't it would have been all cuss words all anger, but I understand because I felt remorseful when I was in jail. So do I believe that he's remorseful? Yes, wholeheartedly I believe you remorseful, but it's consequences for our actions. But you said you say um, <clears throat> family hasn't been able to mourn. Mm -hmm. um, what will it take for you to be able to mourn? Because this is, as you said, it's a high profile case. They're going to continually talk about this for as long as it takes. Yeah, Just but like and it's always open up a wound. So it's like if we got a cut, and we put a Band-Aid on it, and then we bang it again, and now it's bleeding again. And then you put another Band-Aid on it, and you bang it, and it's bleeding again. It never properly heals because everywhere you look, this is the case. I got to ask you a question. That when you went to jail, mm -hmm. when you cut the guy and you shot the guy, hypothetically, if he had passed away, do you think that you should be locked up for the rest of your life? Or do you feel like you should be able to get out after so long of a time? So me on the inside would say I would want to be out. Yeah, but well, I, I'm talking about, you know, right. for that particular crime because this is what we're this right. is the same right. thing we're I, I get at. you I get you I get the hypothetical yeah. but I'm saying it's consequences for our actions and even with that situation when I thought that guy was going to pass I was instantly remorseful because in my mind I wasn't coming home and I'm like I'm going to be locked up forever so do I think prison uh, changes people because there's no in between and I've been in Leavenworth I've been in Forest City you either going to come out with your mind correct, which you have to start in there doing, saying I'm going to get out and I'm going to do ABC, or you're going to get out worse. But it's never no in between with that mindset. Wow. So you saying no or yes? Yes. That he should be able to get out or he should, a person that does this, if a person dies, should they ever be able to get out of prison? So I th I'm, I'm going to say I think they should be able to get out on certain terms. And this is what I'm saying. Okay. If you are truly remorseful, 
it's I'm sorry this happened that happened but if you can't even acknowledge your wrongdoing then no you shouldn't get out okay I get what you're that's saying. what I'm saying so it yeah. comes with a stimulation I, I, I get where you come right mm-hmm. so the the Kardashians when like I said if you lost a 16 at the time you was 16 years old mm-hmm. um if with all the people saying C murder is innocent they say that he didn't do this and a lot of the families the grandmothers everybody campaigning because that's their that's their loved one Correct. like what do you say to those people at first I tell those people to go do their research I know some of us as black people don't like to read at all some may can't I learned that in prison too we have a lot of literary people but do the research first and foremost. So go read. I put the case law even on my YouTube. So they can go look at it. They can go read it from beginning to end. If you don't believe it from there, I, I don't know what else to say. Wango's dead, so no one can talk to him. Yeah, because a lot of people, right. again, like she alluded to earlier, about the system, about the black and white, about trusting the black and white. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Trusting a system that has oppressed our people for so long. You know, I get it, you got the black and white. You right. know what I'm saying? But that black and white that Can you Can be got, altered. Of course. We know how they work. Right, right, right. So you understand what I'm saying? It's so much more to it. Whether it was, you lost a brother. That's the most impactful thing that, man, I, I don't even know, you, you'll never get over that, bro. Just like I lost my mom, my dad. That That's that something that never, you're gonna have ever, for the rest of your life. That empty spot will never be filled, bro. Never. Not so I I and he was sixteen, that's even worse. Because he never got to live out his life. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? But that system, you know what I'm saying? Right. That correctional, whatever that is, that judgment, that scale that sits like mm-hmm. that. That has victimized a lot of our people, bro. You and I both know that. So All I right. get it the black and white is there all day long but i also get it. i can't trust it far as get you you know because of me yeah i get you but we victimize us as blacks too so we push this don't snitch agenda don't do this agenda correct if someone was killed in a white neighborhood a hispanic neighborhood they're going to tell who did it they're going to clean up their community yeah we don't get that you get a this person is a snitch this person is a rat even coming home i didn't know how to use a computer i was one of those that was yeah, borderline yeah, yeah, illiterate. yeah for sure right so i signed up for classes at itt and i'm around ITT. 18 and 19 year old kids that's running circles around me i don't know a power switch from a monitor i don't know even ITT the lane in dallas no and Louisiana. It was down there too? Yeah. Dang. When I, I, I know was that. in a halfway house, as a matter of yeah, fact. Yeah. Because Glenn Metz, who I just said, that's who Kim Kardashian should go look into. Okay. His case, if you want to help somebody, nonviolent offender given three life sentences. That's who case she, she need to go look into. But you know, and I know why Kim, why Kim Kardashian deals with that case because of the profile. Right. It's high, it's high profile. profile. Right. It's people that her, she, she actually more likely friends with a lot of the people right. in those circles, man. So, and, and that don't make it right or wrong. I'm just saying we know why. But what happens. I'm saying is the ignorance. So when I signed up for ITT, uh, the professor there, I explained to her that I don't know nothing. So she agrees to come to school an hour early and stay an hour late if I agree to have her build me up. And I did that for 12 months. And mm. then I ended up graduating with a 3.9 GPA. And I took the second two years and went to LSU and got a bachelor's degree. Mm. So brothers that don't want to learn can't tell me nothing because I came from that and I, I, I taught. So first I give God, because that's where it come from. But mm-hmm. if you don't want to learn, then nobody could help you. So I can't make them go look at anything. Yeah, brother. I, I but, definitely get it. But I would think that, you know, you know how earlier you said that all, you know, foreclosure is really just for him to say, you know, what he did and be remorseful and so mm-hmm. forth. If he did. It. If he did it. <laughs> right. But when you think about a person and even if someone was supposed mm-hmm. to step forward and do something like that and know that maybe I would get less of time or I could come out and stuff like that. And when the, the public see that 
you can come out if you if you even say something like that as a possibility to early release or whatever because the family probably wouldn't even fight it because you just you know so forth but when the person doesn't do that and say you know what i'm innocent even after so many years 20 years and not seeing my family not being around my kids my grandkids whoever that alone would make some people especially if they don't know about the case very well be like man that man must be innocent because why would somebody who is guilty not just take you know just say it and just get out so he was offered a plea trial agreement which y'all probably don't know as well he was offered 20 years which means he would have been out now mm -hmm. he didn't want to take that deal Right. He said he's not taking it. Because he feel, he says he's innocent. Right. Right. So in Louisiana, first degree murder, second degree murder, mandatory life sentences. But the thing is, again, and it's crazy, if he's feel like he's innocent, he's not going to take that. He's not going to take that either. So it's two ways you got to look at it. And also, you got to think about they're saying now that this is what I've been hearing recently. And you correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong. That uh, he could have said they've offered him situations where he could have blamed somebody else for doing mm -hmm. it, whether it be Soldier Slim mm -hmm. or somebody else. And he's not even willing to do that. So for him not to do that and not to be not to fail, not to fold just to come home, you see what I'm saying? Right. It, that further makes people look at him as he's innocent. And if you, you were in that situation. And say, okay, let's let's look at it both ways, because mm -hmm. you know we try to be fair. Okay. Um, if you were in that situation, knowing that you were innocent, and you and they gave you all of this, would you take the plea deal and come out early? Yeah, oh, after being in, yeah. Or if I'm no, in this situation even in, now, in this situation, knowing that you're innocent, I'm. I'm no, I'm, what are we talking about? No. Before court or? Before trial, or are we talking? I'm talking about when now? the plea deal came up, and he had the chance. No, to... because I didn't take mine. Remember, right? And I was guilty, and I didn't take mine. So, like, I, I probably still wouldn't have because you would have to say you are guilty, and everybody goes to court mm -hmm. thinking you're going to win. That's what mm -hmm. we all think as young black men. No. You going to win? But even after this much time, twenty now, years. Now, after this much time. And you asked and he's me still who not, did it, right? right. And he's and, still not taking a deal. He's still not doing. But anything. not only that, you said you not. If you didn't do it, then who did do it? But you said your principles and morals won't allow you to say who did it. Right. That's child stuff. That's not grown man stuff. I'm a grown man with kids now. Is why I'm telling you. Nobody's going to put me in a position to take me away from my children. Like, no, these are my kids. These are my loved ones. So if you knew who was who who had done it, you would have told? Yeah, with a flying banner. I'm calling ABC, NBC, Fox. It don't matter. That's Call me now. what you that's want. That's now. That's not back when you first got arrested. No, that's what I said. That's yeah, what I yeah. said. You're now. older now. Right. I'm older now. And but he's was, older now, he's but he's older still now. saying that he won't say who did it. Correct. So how does but, that sound but to that's you? That's a code that they live by. You know that snitch. Yeah, that's bulls. But Those you know brothers. this code is a real situation where brothers is locked up and 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 they know they got to come back out here and face the music of whatever they say. Mm -hmm. It's a code to where a person don't tell on another person. And you and I both know that. And yeah. I'm not in this situation to be locked up 20 years. Gotcha. I don't even know mentally how I would look at that. Right. But as a 21 year old, 18 year old, in my heart, I was willing to die. With not snitching on somebody. Yeah, me too. That's just the way we were that brought up, then. bro. You know what I'm saying? That's right. the way we was, man. I was hustling in the street. I wasn't fit to tell on nobody. I wasn't fit to rat. I wasn't fit to do none of that. I just wasn't going to do it. And I can't say mentally, if I was locked up 20 years, that I would do it because of the way the code I'm built up on. But I get where you're going. I'm, bit, I'm away from my kids. And that's right. the part of what you're talking about. But I was away from my kids when I went through my situation back then, and I wasn't for the tell it. Right, but that was then. So we, we cut, like you said. So if a man still thinks, so this is what I think. You at 20, 21, and you fast forward. 23, 24, where you dealing with right, this world. But you fast forward to 40 and 41, 
and you still think that way, you just wasted 20 years yeah, of your time, Yeah, but that's bro. coming from a brother who outside walking on the pavement. But if you locked up and you with these people and they living by this code, it's hard for me to say what I would do. You know what I'm saying? And you're not, you can't even say that because I'm, look at this now. Look at this. Everybody, majority of men that I've seen that come out, when you went in with a certain mentality, yes, if you've been in the law library and so forth, you've gotten wiser um, book-wise and stuff like that. But in your heart and your mind, you're still at a certain stage in your life as the same when you went in, in a certain way. That's why mentally, I, mentally, mentally, right, mentally, you understand what I mean? So certain principles and certain things, you're going to still live by that code all the way through because you're not out here to readjust to any any changes that has happened out here. However you went in, in that mental state, you're still coming out with that. Education-wise, you have excelled if you've been studying. Right. But certain principles, you still have those same principles when you come out until you start learning when you get out. Right, and I'm not putting myself in that position again. I'm not going to be in a situation. Yeah, he ain't going to blame something. you with nothing like yeah, that. Yeah, I no don't. I hang with nerds and ball players. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to say, so, I, I, man, again, I know nothing we can say is going to bring your brother back. But, I mean, you know, I definitely, definitely, I, I hate it happen. And I hate, I, I know how people are, man. You know what I'm saying? We, we done been through so much. You know what I'm saying? But your brother, you could never get your brother back, bro. Right, and all the family wanted, brother, was an apology. And I wrote C. Murder a letter, which the audience probably don't even know. But I wrote him a heartfelt letter, and I know he received it because his lawyer called me. And we talked um, about other things, and I expressed how I felt. My dad still can't talk until this day. Every time he try to talk, he has a nervous breakdown. Every time, to a point where he takes medicine now. This is the stuff that the family go through. Wow, Steve. Thomas, 16 years old, passed away. And like I said, my biggest deal was a 16-year-old kid that's not here no more. That's a tough pill to swallow, especially from your your parents and you as a brother. How about your, old, your older brother? Yeah, he's, uh, he's better in his older age as well, but he went through it as well, man. <laughs> Yeah, just he, uh, he had to get himself together from the army as well as this stuff. And I talked to him. Me and him are like real, real close now, man. What are you expecting now that you're speaking out? And I'm gonna wrap this up. Mm -hmm. What are you, What are you expecting to gain from telling your story now? Um, just that that everyone would just quit saying that C murder is innocent without actually going look at the facts and a heartfelt apology from him. Or whomever he feel responsible for it. I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, have you prepared yourself that you're not gonna get that? I, I really haven't because I'd like to see the good in people. The reason why I say that, mm -hmm. um, this world is divided. Right. No matter what, you could post something. You're gonna have half. It could be something yeah, simple. I know this. You're gonna have <laughs> that's gonna say this, and you're gonna have half that says that. Whether they believe it or not, you have some trolls. Or you have some people who genuinely believe because we all, as human beings, have different perspectives. And we all are not going to agree on the same things. So that's the reason why I ask you, are you prepared? Because you might have some that are going to be like, yes, what you're saying is totally true and I'm, I'm totally with you. But you're going to have the other half that's going to say, no, it's not like that. That's why I said, that's why I kept saying earlier that it will never end because you're going to have the other half that's going to always say that. That's what I'm like. That's something you're going to have to prepare yourself for. Okay. You yeah. see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another thing, like I said, the one thing I do know is, you know, that peace that you look for, for me, it only comes through God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with That's you. That's the only thing that gives me peace that surpasses knowledge and understanding. Things that you cannot figure out, there's something in God to help you with that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's, the only, that's that quiet, still voice that... It, it, you know, it, it, it helps you to deal with family that you're dealing with today, your children. You know, you can't hold unforgiveness in because it affects your family even more. Your children's children. Your children's children. So that's the big deal, you know, is that you have to, at some place, find forgiveness in your heart like you say you have, you know, and, and pass it on to your children. Um, what do you tell your children about their uncle that they never got to meet? 
that he was uh, funny, and I always tell uh, my son is one now. He's so his comprehension is still mm-hmm. little. Okay. But I always tell him he reminds me of my brother. Curly hair, always smiling, loved the ladies even at one. Yeah. He won't let any man hold him, but he'll go to all the girls. Yeah, man. yeah. <laughs> so, so that's that's the one thing that you can always see the 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 good in your kids and the genetics and the fact of 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 you know that part of it, man. I've lost some people. I found my uncle dead uh, when I was thirteen. You know, um, those things like that. You never you never get over. You never you never figure it out. You're always asking yourself why, you know? You know, I always say this. Um, I always say everything happens for a reason. That's something that I live by as I got older. Mm -hmm. Um, And people always say to me, how can you say something, you know, everything happens for a reason? Because what happened to a child who um, dies at birth? Um, How is God, you know, merciful with a child that dies? Or people who lose their sons or daughters or especially with violence and stuff like that. And I always feel like, and this is me personally, because if you concentrate on the evil that's in this world, you're going to end up being succumbed by that evil through hate. So for me, I always say that when God, when you're born, God clock you in at this job because life is a job. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to touch other people through our life, whether verbally or the way how we walk, because people watch your life, people, especially with social media now, so many people are watching you right now. And they can change their lives because of you. And you don't have to even come in contact with them. So when God take you from this world, that means that your job was done. Whatever it is. And people are like, well, what happened to that person who he keep robbing and killing and stealing and so forth? Okay, but when he died, and you can't tell me that everything he's done from the day he was born till now is all evil. He might be evil to these people, but he might be good to somebody else. Right. And somebody else been watching his life and probably was going to go down that same route that he went down, but because of the way how they saw him live, changed their mind. We, we will never see or know, but that person know that, you know what, if I didn't see him walk his walk and end up the way he did, I wouldn't have changed my life. And because of that, that person changed their life and became president, became whatever. But that person was the person who was going to kill that person around the street tomorrow if he didn't pass away today. You, yeah. you understand mm-hmm. what I mean? So that's how I personally, I don't know if it helps anybody else, but me, I have to hold on to something knowing that, you know, everything happens for a reason. And God, all our lives are predestined. When you first came home, how old was you? 25, 24. You wanted revenge. Yeah, I did. That's and I told him this personally you wanted, in a letter. You wanted revenge. I know what a 25-year-old thinks like. They, they, and you've been locked up. So you, and you, and you already been known for the smoke. So people already was expecting him to retaliate, retaliate some kind of way. That's the way. That's the way the hood work. That's the way the streets work. Am I right? You're right. So how did you? And I know you talked about forgiveness, but you just went straight into forgiveness. But how did you get? And we're gonna close this up. But how did you get over that hump? How did you figure it out? Um, so I got. Baptized in prison. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm try to speed it up. That's for fine. You. Go ahead. So it was a fight in jail when I had like uh, 18 months on the way of getting out, and everything is color coordinated. Blacks hang with blacks, of whites in the feds. So I had been there a long time, so I had somewhat of a name. So a new white guy comes in, and they tell him to attack me. So when he attacks me, I defend myself, of course. of course, and he have no fight in him when yeah. I hit him. Of course. So then all the youngsters now see this because of the status in the prison. So they stump him to a point wow. to where he's bleeding. So they was trying to give me a brand new street charge and yeah. said I tried to incite a riot. Yeah, just because so, they knew he was coming home. So I'm in the hole now, two weeks, yeah, like 14 days. So the prison chaplain's coming. He want to talk to me. I don't want to talk because I'm now I'm thinking like I'm going to be stuck in here forever. The last day, that 14th day, he asked to pray with me. And I didn't have nothing else to turn to. And I'm crying because I'm thinking I'm never going home. He prays with me. The next day, I get a kite, which we call in prison. Of course. Comes down. Mm-hmm. The white guy says, I'm going to get you back, but not like this. I'm not testifying. So they dropped all the charges. A week later, they put us on a bus and transfer us to a new facility. You I, and him? No. No, me. they had to be in separate facilities. Right. So, But I go to a new facility with the people that get transferred with me. 
And then I find out because that prison, Forest City, was overcrowded. I go home six months early. So I knew that was the power of God because mm-hmm. I let him pray. So I, I stayed on that mission, even though I wasn't 100% there. I stayed on that mission of trying to read and trying to understand. Even when you got out? So when I got out, I still had the anger and hatred. Of course. Because I didn't know how to tame it. And like I said, I wanted to know what happened. So doing my own research, when I get all of this stuff, and when he's convicted at the second trial, you still hurt because you still can't get your brother back. But um, I'm talking to older people now, mentors, my uncles, other guys, and they like, make Hold sure on. you stay on this positive. Excuse me. What they explained to me was if someone's, uh, if you take something from someone and you want revenge on that person, it's like drinking poison. Mm-hmm. And expecting the other person to die. That's what revenge wow. is. Yeah. You, so, who told you that? That my uncle. Wow. So that's what got my mind right to say, you know what? He was like, what can it change? And then I watched my dad deteriorate. Yeah. And he was like, you do you want this? And I was like, no, I want peace. He was like, well, you have to forgive. So I went to my pastor. I explained the situation to my pastor. And he prayed with me. And I felt all the anger and hate leave. Wow. So at that point, I wasn't mad. So I took it upon myself to write C. Murder a letter explaining everything I'm telling you. That, hey, I wanted revenge. This is why I believe you did it. Because Wango said you did it and Peanut and all of this. So your fight is not with me. I still believe you did it. But I said, I forgive you. And from this forward, this day forward, your fight is with God. And wow. I leave you in his hands. Wow. And the crazy part about it again as I go back to those people that you named, I just think about all the stuff that went on in the last 20 years. And it's such a, it's like a big mess, man. Like, and it's crazy, but this is the way it goes. You know what I mean? When you start dealing with judicial systems, when you right. start dealing with our people and them telling their truth for our people are messed up, bro. You know that. Yeah. And that's the part where I think it really is something. That's why I say even now when I talk to the little kids and they always say, oh, it's hard to believe you've been in prison. I say, amen. That's the goal. That's what they say to you. Yeah. I'm L7 square. That is exactly who I am. (laughs) So if you say it's hard to say I've been in prison, amen, job well done, because that's the goal. Well, hey, man, I'm going to be honest with you, man. George, we love you, bro. We love you. We definitely, I'm glad we did this segment. Like I said, I don't, I still can't say, I don't know if C Murder done it. I don't know because of the people and right. the court system. Mm-hmm. Free C Murder is something you're going to hear from now on. You're not going to stop hearing Free C mm-hmm. Murder. You have, you've come to grips with that, right. I know. Mm-hmm. They're not going to stop saying that. And I can't blame them for saying that because the fact of, what they may feel or what they right. see. Mm-hmm. And I can't blame you for saying what you're saying because of what you see. You know what I'm saying? But I can't say I'm sorry that you lost your brother. Okay. I, 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 he was 16 years old. I hate that this happened to y'all family. And I would pray that some kind of way God grant y'all the peace that y'all deserve. I know y'all, this is tough. You'll never be able to bring your brother back, as I keep saying. But at the end of the day, I think with you, with your pure heart and the way that you are searching and talking to God, it can help your family, it can help your mom, it can help, and it probably already have, it can help your dad. You are a leader in that family. If your oldest brother have PTSD, and you pretty much, God then gave you, uh, granted you a way to where you can see visions through God, mm-hmm. that's big, man. That's big because you're able to tap into places through the Holy Ghost that they're not. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So you're able to help them. And that's what I see when I deal with this whole situation. That's the part. That's the part of things happen for a reason. Whatever it was that happened to you through your brother, it drove you closer to God. I know that for a fact. You trying to understand anger. Anger is something that's exploited when you lose control. Right. So now you're able to harness that anger and able to understand forgiveness. And I think that's a big breakthrough. And lead by example and help so many others who are going through loss. Kids. Who want to retaliate, who don't know how to act. You're that example for others. You understand what I mean? So I just say keep keep the journey of trying to help people to understand when you take a great loss, when you lose a brother and you have to deal with it and you come from confinements. You got to realize I deal with a lot of people. Uh, Shawnee Lowe Jr. lost his mother and his dad. Mm Mm-hmm. 
That was on my show. Right, I saw. And his grand didn't he lose he his, lost his granddaddy too? People yeah. don't realize that all that was done in the same yeah stand stint of four years, and it would happen in the same year. Wow. So mm -hmm. you know um, these things are happening continuously, but p people like you and him are able to speak to those victims and help them to understand mm -hmm. how to go through their situation. So prison ministry would be great for somebody like you because you could help so many guys just going through that's that. That's what I'm doing now. You go, to, you do prison ministry. Yeah. So that's that's big. That's why we have to be an example and help others. We have to reach back and snatch people out of the fire that's going through it, bro. That's so I appreciate you, man. Thank you, brother. How long Thank you been you. doing the prison ministry? I got it. We ask just you that started now. this year. In February. That's hard. That's so hard. So Trinity Team. That's yeah. what it. That's what my nonprofit was founded on. So you really, really. With see murder being locked up, it's a place in your heart where you want to find a way to understand how to make him feel freedom. Right, because I talk to when I say his camp is not his family, it's the lawyers that are always call. Correct. So when they call and uh, I, I'm able to speak articulate where they can understand, and we got to a point where we're not yelling and cussing. And uh, what you just asked, he asked the same thing, like what you guys want. I, and I explained like peace of an apology. The money was never the issue, but if that's the case, because that's what he was talking as well. And I was like, my parents should have been awarded that because they won that. So that should have been given without them asking for anything. I said, but this is not why I'm here. What I want personally will be in a heartfelt apology. And if you didn't do it, if you say you didn't do it, then tell me who did it. But with this, it's hard for me to believe that you didn't do it. And when I look another man in the eye that's a, a known killer and a known street guy who tell me you the one who killed my brother, you got no reason to lie to me. Wow, man, it's tough, man. Like I said, we lost two lives that day or that at that time. We lost C. Murder and we lost your brother. You lost two people, the system. And ain't nothing we can really, you know, right. there's no justification in that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, guys. How for can people me. reach out to you if they want to uh, talk to you or, or turn um, to They could hit me up through the, the YouTube. is the Trinity Team channel. I even give you guys my phone number. Like I said, I don't have nothing to hide. I ain't scared. It's 504-289-1290. Wow. So. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101, where the bosses talk. And we out. Come on.